We miss a whole lot. Well, this morning's come. The day has dawned. And here it is. I want to speak about this morning to actually uh, a, sta- a statement and a question. Living out of what you hear. And then, how then shall we live? Anybody ever heard of Chuck Colson? Chuck Colson wrote a book some years ago now, probably about that thick. And it was called, How Then Shall We Live? And uh, he was Richard Nixon's hatchet man in uh, the USA administration, and he went to prison. But Chuck started a prison ministry out of that which has touched prisons around the world, amazingly, in quite an amazing way. So, living out of what you hear, but then how then shall we live? I'm going to share a true story. It was uh, an Australian school teacher that actually shared this story, and I don't want to offend anybody, but because it's true, and I'm already said about living out of what you hear, I think it's relevant. It was after some holidays and the teacher asked the students if they'd write a little bit of a letter about their holidays and what they did, how they spent the time. And so this was one child's response in the little letter. We always used to spend the holidays with Grandma and Granddad. They used to live in a big brick house, but Grandpa got retarded and they moved to Batemans Bay where everyone lives in nice little houses and so they don't have to mow the grass anymore. They ride around on their bicycles and scooters and wear name tags because they don't know who they are anymore. They go to a building called a rec centre, but they must have got it fixed because it's all okay now. They do exercises there, but they don't do them very well. There's a swimming pool too, but they all jump up and down with hats on. At their gate, there's a dollhouse with a little old man sitting in it. He watches all day so nobody can escape. Sometimes they sneak out and go cruising in their golf carts. Nobody there cooks, they just eat out. And they eat the same thing every night, early birds. Some of the people can't get out past the man in the dollhouse. The ones who do get out bring food back to the rec centre for potluck. My grandma says that Grandpa worked all his life to earn his retirement and says I should work hard so that I can be retarded someday too. (laughs) When I earn my retirement, I want to be the man in the dollhouse. Then I'll let people out so they can visit their grandchildren. (laughs) How good is that? Now, he heard something, but it wasn't quite right. And he was living out of what he heard. And uh, the fact is, we live out of what we hear. You know, the statistics say that today, in an average day, we hear about the amount of information equivalent to six newspapers in our day. The information that's circling around about us all the time. So it's quite incredible, really, what is happening around about us. Uh, If you look at the states and you see Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, that's very interesting. And uh, a pastor who's a bishop in a coloured church just recently presented Donald Trump with a a prayer shawl from Israel. And he actually draped it around him, said to him, uh, I've been fasting over this and praying over this. And so I just believe as we put something around you, there'll be an impartation that will help you when difficult times come. I don't know whether he was saying, really, we believe you're going to be the man that's going to be the president. But anyway, he was certainly doing something about it. So, living out of what we hear. Jesus said in John 10, verse 27, a simple statement. He said, my sheep hear my voice. They follow me. Or I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So I want to read, first of all, from Hebrews chapter 1. Interesting, the letter to the Hebrews, from my understanding, it was written uh, to believers of Jewish descent, somewhere about the last half of the first century. And uh, now here we are in the 21st century, and it's still, still very, very relevant. So it says this, Long ago, at different times and in various ways, God's voice came to our ancestors through the Hebrew prophets. 
But in these last days it's come to us through his Son, the one who's been given dominion over all things and through whom all worlds were made. Very interesting, isn't it, that it speaks right back there about in these last days. Uh, and this is not an end time message in the sense, it's a now time message, I trust, and as I go on, that that will become clearer. I'm going to read then from Revelation 22, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos and the revelation that had been given to him. And Jesus is speaking in this particular part here and he said, See, I'm coming soon. That was also written quite some time ago. And I'll bring my reward with me. I'll pay back every person according to the deeds he's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first one and the last one, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their garments. In the end, they have rightful access to the tree of life, will enter the city through its gates. The next verse is a fairly heavy verse, and it says, Dogs, sorcerers, immoral practices, murderers, idolaters, and all who love and practice deception will be outside the gates for all eternity. That's a fairly heavy deal, isn't it, really? And the fact that, that what Jesus lumped together in there were murderers with idolaters and uh, sorcerers with dogs, uh, practicing deception, the depth of that linked in with immoral practices. So very, very clear in what he had to say. In the next verse he said, I, Jesus, have sent my messenger, thank God for that, to show you and guide you so that you in turn would share this testimony with the churches. I'm the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Just a few weeks ago we had Pastor Al Halton who came here it was a great blessing to us and I trust if you weren't here, I'd encourage you to get the DVD because there was certainly a word from the Lord to us as a people. First thing he said was, God said to him, I'll visit this people. And then after that, he felt God say to him, I'll activate the heart of David in this people. That's very interesting words. And as I go on sharing, I'm not actually preaching to you this morning, I'm just sharing out of my own journey over some months now as I've wrestled in the things with God myself and sought to listen to him and hear what he was saying and so these are the things that really have been a part of my journey. The next reading I'm going to read is from Matthew 24 and it's a prophetic picture and Jesus again is speaking and there's two questions that have been asked here, very interesting questions. The first one was what do you think of our building? And Jesus' answer to that was uh, not very encouraging because it had spent some decades in building that temple and his response simply said uh, was there's not going to be one stone left on top of another. Uh, that's where the building is. And then he said about the second question was and what about the end of the age? What about your return? What, what, what are we looking for? And I'm going to read on verses 4 to 8 of Jesus speaking. And the first thing he said in his response was, take heed that you are not deceived. I believe without any shadow of a doubt, the number one issue in our day before Jesus comes back is deception. Deception is incredible. It's all around about us. We can see it every day. We can smell it every day almost. And uh, it's amongst leaders and so forth. So this Jesus, take heed, you're not deceived. Many will come in my name claiming they are the anointed one, and many poor souls will be taken in. You'll hear of wars, you'll hear of rumours of wars, but you should not panic. It's inevitable, this violent breaking apart of the sinful world. But remember, I don't know what your Bible's like, but if you looked at mine, I don't add anything to it except a lot of writing and, and lines and sometimes highlights and whatever else. And it's a fascinating thing. If you... As you read through your Bible, underline every time it says remember. There's quite a lot of times that the Bible speaks about remembering. Probably a lot of the ones that we as Christians remember is Paul saying, uh, forget the things that are behind. We probably can all quote that. Forget the things that are behind, pressing on, really, and laying hold of that what's ahead. But the Bible says a lot about remembering. And uh, Jesus said, remember, the wars are not the end. The end is still unfolding. Nations will do battle with nations. Kingdoms will fight 
neighboring kingdoms. There'll be famines and earthquakes. And boy, haven't we seen a lot of that over recent times in an amazing way, devastating things that have taken place. You know, in Syria of recent times, I read where one significant rabbi in Israel had made the statement that actually what was happening in Syria was the Battle of Armageddon. So there's a lot of interesting things that get said in this day and age, and we've got to know what Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. I know them, they follow me. So I believe we really certainly need to know that. So, and North Korea recently, I'm not about gloom and doom, I really, I want to finish on a good note, but this is the world we're living in, and North Korea's got some interesting people in it, and they've just fired a missile just recently that was six times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima back in the world. There's a lot of powerful things going on. I'm not saying this to frighten anybody. I'm actually talking all this to myself as to how then shall I live? How then shall you live? That's really the question in my own heart. Kingdoms and there'll be famines and earthquakes, but these are not the end. They are the birth pang, pangs, the beginning. The end is still unfolding. Mentioned twice there, the end is still unfolding. Jesus goes on there, and I'm not going to read the verses of Scripture, but you can do that. And he speaks about five things that start with P. For me, I'm, the way my brain works is I, I sort of like things that I can get a word and it starts with the same letter. Something registers in my own head. First thing he spoke about was pressure. And uh, I don't have to tell you, we live in a day where there's a reasonable amount of pressure around the place. You don't have to go looking for it. I found it turns up in the most strange places, really, and all of a sudden there it is, and you're faced with it. Pressure is all around about it. Persecution. Uh, don't want to linger on that one. Uh, persecution. Jesus spoke very clearly about persecution. And, of course, we see, obviously, in our world uh, some people that experience that in an incredible way, and uh, they live through it. Pollution. One of the big things for the Greens is global warming. Now, I don't know where you stand on that. It doesn't matter where I stand on it. The simple factor is I think it's a whole lot of hocus-pocus. Anyway. The next thing is presumption. A lot of presumption around. I happen to go into my computer. How many people have got a computer? How many find you get a lot of stuff comes your way? And uh, I get stuff from the event centre. Now, I'm not anti that. That's in Caloundra. But the big thing coming up is Jesus Christ Superstar. Isn't it amazing? That's a presumption that he's only a superstar. And you know, the write-up about that says that Judas was his best friend. That's presumption. There's a lot of presumption around the place. And, and uh, men, I don't want to be a person who just presumes something. I don't want to presume the end's going to work out. Or I want to know. It's going to work. I want something to hang on to that's tangible. I want to just sort of waffle around, really. And the last thing, the last P was preaching. Praise God. He said there's preaching. The good news is going to be preached throughout the whole world before he comes again. So praise God for preaching. Eh? Paul said about the foolishness of preaching, some can get saved. I thought many times when I've been preaching the foolishness of preaching, to be honest, I'm not taking away anything from God or the Word, but the foolishness of preaching. Man, we rack up, rock up every Sunday, we sprout again, and off we go again. We all go home then through the week, and we come back, we sprout again, off we go again. My question to me is, am I living out of what I hear? How then shall I live? Are you living out of what you hear? And there's a lot of stuff you could be hearing. Then Paul said a couple of things, and I just want to slip into that on the way through to where I'm going. So this is just a pathway to actually where I'm going. When Jesus was asked the question about the temple, Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Don't you understand that together you form the temple to the living God and his Spirit lives among you? That's the temple that we need to be aware of. Don't we understand together the body of Christ that we're a temple for the living God and his spirit dwells within us. Very relevant, I believe. 
Then Paul's letter to Timothy, as I share this just on the way through, it's uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, verse A. And he starts off like this and says, and know this in the last days. There it is again, in the last days. Now these things were written a long time ago. Hey, how many people here are over 60? How many, it seems, a long time ago you were born? <laughs> but on the other side of that, did you got to where you are very quickly? It's amazing, isn't it? There's two aspects, isn't it? Long time ago, I was born at a very early age. It was an amazing thing how it all happened. <laughs> but I got to almost 77 very, very quickly. It's amazing, incredible. I didn't even have to try. So Paul said this, and know this, in the last days, times will be hard. Anybody want to say amen? I'm not talking about negative confessions. I'm just talking about times will be, are times hard generally or not? I know we can say, oh, hallelujah, I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. Yes, I am. That's in the book. That doesn't take away. Times can be hard. We've seen another friend go home. Now, that's not hard where he's gone. Pastor Bob Collard, if anybody knew Bob, had passed away on Saturday morning and he's gone to join all the others uh, for Hazel and I I was saying to somebody we've lost t uh, 12 family and close friends in the last two years it's amazing how many people are going home just incredible but God's got a plan and it's how then are you going to live you see the world will be filled with narcissistic money grubbing pretentious arrogant and abusive people they'll rebel against their parents and will be ungrateful I never encountered that anyway. I'm amazed at these words. Unholy, uncaring, cold-hearted, accusing, without restraint, road rage, savage, haters of anything good. And then he said something very, expect them to be treacherous. That's a bit of an expectation. Isn't it? Expect there to be some treachery around the place. I'm not talking about suspicion book never tells us to be suspicious it says try the spirits and see what sort they're of. that's the interesting thing e expect them to be treacherous reckless swollen with self-importance given to loving pleasure more than they love God and this next bit blows me right out of my tree even though they may look or act like godly people they're not isn't that an amazing statement all those statements read there and they might look like godly people, but they're not. How then shall I live? How then shall you live? So I want to get to where I'm going, Psalm 71. And this psalm has been major to me. I actually, I put in my diary where I felt God emphasizes something to me. And I put alongside this psalm, 10th of the 2nd, 15. So in February last year, as I was reading through, this psalm became very, very relevant for a number of reasons. But I want to just throw in there Acts 13, 36 on the way through. Speaking of David, it says, We all know David died and was reduced to dust after he served God's purpose in his generation. That's the important part. After he served God. God's purpose in his generation. So Psalm 71, verses 18 to 21, I'll read that, I'll read straight through. And David said, and I'll come back over this, so don't say, oh, that doesn't, I'm not in there, it doesn't count for me. Now as I grow old and my hair turns grey, I ask that you not abandon me, O God. Allow me to share with the generation to come about your power. Let me speak about your strength and wonders to all those yet to be born. God, your justice stretches to the heavens. You who have done mighty things, who is like you, O oh God? You've made me see hard times. I've experienced many miserable days, but you will restore me again. You'll raise me up from the deep pit. You'll greatly increase my status and be my comfort once again. You know what I love about David is he was honest. He said it as it was. He didn't fluff around and make it all sound wonderful. He said life as it was. 
And folks, I tell you what, one of the things I want to do, I want to live life as it is. Stuff happens on the planet. God is God, thankfully. And he has answers and his word is truth. But stuff happens on the planet and you and I are a part of it. So in that area there, I saw six R's, I'll say R's, in David's life as he cries out to God. He says, now, I'm growing old, my hair's turning grey. Now, yours may not be. You mightn't have any there to turn grey. Or you may be too young, really, for that to be happening. But don't exclude yourself. You're not excluded from really the, the gist of what I want to say today. So it's not just for the older saints this morning. We're all here. So the first R I see in this is David's request. Allow me to share of your power to the generation to come, to speak about your strength and your wonders of those yet to be born. What that speaks to me about is a generational focus and the incredible life force that was in David's generational focus. I'm going to read some scriptures shortly about some of the challenges that he faced. You know, I guess we're all aware where David was, Ziglag was a city. And uh, they'd been fighting, he and his men had been fighting. Ziglag was burned. Uh, really, their wives and children were all taken away. And David and his men come back and they find all their wives and children missing. They find their city burned. And it says, really, they wept. Now, this is weeping. I've wept a few times. They wept until they had no more to weep. They were all wept out. And then, in spite of all that, David's men, no matter about his great leadership and whatever, spoke about stoning him. And what did David do? It says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Not a lot of words, is it? In a situation like that, David encouraged himself in the Lord. So those times where you and I find ourselves and, and there's not somebody else, it's just you and God. And you've got to encourage yourself in the Lord. That's how it is. So the first one, that request, and uh, where he said there, don't abandon me. You know, our English word, when we take abandon, that means totally remove, let go of, gone. But in the Hebrew, that word means relinqu relinquish. David was saying, do not relinquish me, O God, or for us, our understanding would be used by date. God, don't put a use by date on me. Really, that's the real issue of what he was saying. Then he went on and he said, the realisation, your justice is immeasurable. You're the doer of mighty things. Who is like you? David positioning himself before his God. Again, remembering, reminding himself, God, who's like you? Your justice is it's immeasurable. It just goes on and on in spite of the circumstances of life that come around about me. Your justice continues. You are the doer of mighty things. You know, the doer of mighty things is in a simple verse, isn't it? To him who's able to work all things together for good for those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. So there's a bit of a qualification in there. But the doer of mighty things, he's able to work all things together for good as we love him and his purpose is unfolding in our life. Third one is reality. He simply said, I've seen hard times and miserable days. Life is unfair, but God is just. You ever found that? Life is unfair. I mean, terrible things happen to good people. I know a lot of good people that have experienced terrible things and they're lovers of God. They're not followers of the devil. They're really lovers of God. You've, you've made me see hard time, miserable days. There, this, just a couple of things I'm going to read out of uh, Psalm 59. I don't know whether I've put these things up there. I don't know. They're all up there. Anyway, I'm going to read just Psalm 59, uh, four verses or five verses. David speaking. Rescue me, save me, O my God, from my enemies. Set me in a safe place far above any who come to attack me. Rescue me from these malicious people. Save me from these bloodthirsty murderers. They've staked out my life. They're going to ambush me. 
Those brutes are aligned, ready to attack me for no good cause, my eternal one. I've not crossed them. I've done nothing wrong. Yet they rush ahead to start the assault. I beg you to help me. Come and see for yourself. I plead with you, eternal one, commander of heavenly armies, true God of Israel, to get up and punish these people. Do not let any betrayer off the hook. Show no mercy to malicious evildoers. That's fairly clear language, isn't it? But it was also pretty difficult circumstances from what I can see in there. Hard times and miserable days. The fourth R that I see in these verses that I read was restoration. You will raise me up from the deep pit and restore me. I've discovered there's a lot of deep pits in life. Loss of hope. Loss of hope's a terrible thing. If your circumstances that have come against you or maybe those you love and hope seems to have departed. And in Proverbs 13, it simply says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When hope seems to depart, really a heart becomes sick. Financial loss can be incredibly difficult, really. But then relationship loss. I don't think there's anything more difficult and challenging than the loss of relationship. That really lives with you, that lives in you, that confronts you, hits you right between the eyes. And so David was saying, look, in all of this, really, my dreams might be smashed at the moment. This seems to be where it's at. But you will raise me up from the deep pit. And if you've experienced anything to do with depression, you know what an incredibly deep pit that is. I'm not talking about being depressed. I'm talking about depression. Very big difference between being depressed and depression. Very deep pit. But you'll restore me. Future might look bleak, bleak, but the rest of that Proverbs 13 says, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Where do we see the tree of life? I was sharing a couple of Sundays ago in communion. Right in the beginning of the first book was the tree of life, and right at the end of the last book was the tree of life. When the desire comes, thank God, there's life that comes back and floods over us. And the fifth thing that I saw for there was rejuvenation. You'll greatly increase my status. Now, I don't believe David was just simply saying out of ego, you know, you're going to make me better than anyone else. I'm the king anyway. But really, you're going to lift me up. God, your favour is going to come around about me. If you want a little verse that's really a great one, well, there's lots of little verses, but uh, Psalm 5 verse 12 is a great little verse that I speak and declare regularly. It simply says, His favour wraps around me like a shield. Now, favour is a wonderful thing really in your life anyway. Favour goes before you and does stuff. But there it says, but it wraps around me like a shield as well. So how good is that, having the favour of God? So David really in his rejuvenation was saying, hey, God's for me. And then Neil says it often, if God be for us, who can be against us? You would have heard it a thousand times from out the front here. If God's for us, who can be against us? Well, there can be a lot of things against us, whether they're people, whether they're demonic spirits, whether they're issues of life. There can be a lot of things that come against us, but we can say, hallelujah, God will greatly increase my status, and for you and I, it's who I am in Christ. New creation in Christ Jesus. And the sixth star... Uh, if those first five, if you look at those first five, they all relate to God's ability and capacity to meet our needs. But the sixth star is response. There's always a response in the Word of God. And for me, the response is, how will I respond to maintain a generational focus where I don't live with, oh, I'm all washed up and I've got to use by date, but I'm still looking for those yet to be born, to pray for, to believe for, maybe to communicate with, to speak about the wonders and power and the glory of God, still believing, holding fast to that generational focus. You know, we're not over the hill, thank God for that, hey. We're just coming down the other side, at a run. That's the good part. Anyway, how, how do I, my, how then shall we live? I keep coming back to that. First one in these verses that read on from here, 
verses 22 to 24. I'm just going to speak. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to speak to them. The first I will is I'll praise you with the help of musical instruments. We've had the opportunity to do that this morning. I'll praise you with the help of musical instruments. Thank God for musicians and singers. Hey, you guys are amazing. We are, we are so blessed in this place. And I'm not saying that to tickle your ears. I'm not into that stuff. I'm into being honest. You guys are such a blessing that you're prepared to really spend time waiting on God and then lead us Sunday morning, especially when you've got to get all that gear up there together in about three quarters of an hour, if that is amazing. You're amazing. So if anybody's giving you a hard time, tell them to come and talk to me. I'm very fast over the first hundred yards, I can tell you that. <laughs> Praise God, that's it. Anyway, praising with musical instruments, and it says in there, because you have been faithful. Just, just let these things rush over you a little bit. We only read a couple of verses back about hard times, miserable days, deep pits. But he said, I'll praise you because you've been faithful. So he was remembering. Hey. Remembering the times where God delivered him out of the hand of Saul. Was it 13 odd years really where Saul chased him trying to take him out? Even threw spears at him in the, in the, in the castle. I was going to say in the temple, in the castle, whatever it was. Anyway, the palace, not the castle. That's right. So I'll do that. Secondly, I will sing praise with an instrument. I haven't got any instrumental ability. So the only instruments I've got are these. And that's about my limit. I have played a comb with a bit of paper on it once or twice. Um, but I probably won't bring that along. So I'll, I will. I'll do something with some instruments that I've got. Thank God I've got these. I can hit them together. And then he went on and he said, O Holy One of Israel. A bit different to because you've been faithful now, a recognition of the holiness of the one that I've come to praise. That's a heart issue, isn't it? Not just a response of gratitude, your faithfulness, but a heart attitude now, O oh, Holy One, I've come to worship you, to praise, to magnify your name. Thirdly, I'll shout for joy. It's not bad for a shout to come out the spout now and then, is it? Remembering, we only read a few verses back about hard times, miserable days, and deep pits. They don't look like real joyous occasions to me. But I'll shout for joy. There's something in the activation, isn't it, really, of this faith, this trust, this believing, the faithfulness, the goodness of God that is for us, really to release it and let it come out. I'll shout for joy. I, I read the first five verses of Psalm uh, 59 before. I'm going to read the last two verses of that same verse where he's talking about murderers, enemies, malicious people, bloodthirsty people coming to ambush me. But this is how the psalm finishes. But me, I'll sing of your strength. I'll awake with the sun to sing of your loving mercy because in most, my most troubled hour you defended me, you were my shelter. I'll lift my voice to sing your praise, O oh my strength. For you came to my defence. O oh God, you have shown me your loving mercy. Had it all happened then? Or was it still in the process? Fourth thing he said, my soul will celebrate. That's something, isn't it? My thought life, my will, my emotions will celebrate. God will celebrate. Not just sort of mumble out a bit of a gratitude, but will celebrate. Something about celebrations, isn't it? Uh, Hazel and I were at a party a while back in Toowoomba at a... Uh, what was that restaurant? Um, Turkish. Anybody ever been to a Turkish restaurant? Hallelujah. Their food is outstanding. Man, I'm going back. Anyway, we, we were there and there, there was a Greek family in there and they were celebrating a young woman's birthday. Now, they know how to celebrate. Hey, we joined in at the end because we were the last there and they were the last there. And the good thing was we were watching all this going on. They were doing the hoopla and I'm not much as good as Anyway, they were doing all their thing. And then they called the young lady out and they gave her this gift wrap thing. wasn't very big. And she unwrapped all this paper. And of course, we're 
peering over, unwrapped it all, and there was a set of keys to a brand new car. Oh, I said, man, how, I'm going to get to know that mob. Hey. But they, they know how to celebrate. And so this is David saying, my soul will celebrate. It will. My emotions, my thoughts, what's going on, my desires are going to celebrate God, the amazingness of who you are. It says, because you had rescued me. Had that already happened? I don't think it had. Not just reading back a couple of verses. Because you've rescued me. Declaration with God. And the fifth is, all day long I will declare how your justice saved me. All day long I will declare. Really all day long. You ever think about Paul saying, pray without ceasing? Say, how the heck do I do that? I've got to work. I've got to think. But it's the activation of a truth within your heart, isn't it? Praying without ceasing is not just praying things out. It's the activation of what's going on, your life that you're living in. Really that coming out of you. And Hebrews 10.35 is a great verse that says, Don't cast away your confidence because it's got great recompense of reward. Don't lose your confidence. David was saying, I'm going to declare this all day long. I'm holding on to my confidence because I know God's going to come through. I know he's faithful. I'm remembering that. I'm going to praise him. My soul's going to celebrate how good he is. I'm going to shout for joy in the midst of the circumstances because I can see the unseen. I see the God who's for me, the God who's watching over me, the God whose favour wraps around about me like a shield. You know, referring back to Pastor Al Houghton, I'll activate the heart of David in this place. That's partly the heart of David. That's how David's heart functioned. And so it's then, how then shall we live? How will we live out of that truth? And I don't know this morning, there may be folks here, you know, that you say deep pits. Boy, I know all about deep pits. They're all around about me right now. About enemies, pressures, really hard times, miserable days, broken dreams, disappointments, broken relationships. can be all those things, really, that can be flowing around about our life. So I'm, I'm not just talking about, you know, presumption. I'm not talking about presumption, just saying stuff because that's what people th think I should say. We're too late in the day for living that life. No good just saying stuff that we think somebody else wants to hear. We need to be able to say from our heart to God, God, this is where I'm at. I, I want to be able to celebrate. I want to praise you. I want to magnify your name. I am going to remember how faithful you are and how faithful you've been. I'm going to remember how you've kept me through and really that deep pit that I've been in or I'm still in or I'm coming out of, you're going to lift me up. And restoration, thank God for restoration. The God of restoration, Acts speaks about restoration of all things. Restoration. In the part of my life where I was building, uh, I did a lot of renovation work and I discovered that in renovation work, there was a lot of restoration work. As you started to pull sheets off walls and found dry rot and goodness knows what, you had to pull it out before you could really put new stuff back in. And then the restoration took place. And I thank God for that experience. For, for me, that's how God shaped my life. I began to see literally by the work, physically doing that, restoration wasn't just, it didn't just drop out of the sky. There's got to be a bit of a removal so that there can be a bit of input coming in. So let's stand together this morning. And this morning, I'd, I'd love to believe God with you. If you really struggle with anything like that, issues, anything that I've spoken about or God's spoken to you, that's the important thing. If the Spirit of God has spoken to you about something and you just say, well, I'd just love somebody to stand with me in agreement this morning. Well, I'm more than happy to do that.
stand in agreement, believe God with you and for you. As the musicians lead us, let's just pray as they come up. Father, today, I just thank you, Lord, as the, the words of the song says, thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and sending your Spirit, leaving your Spirit until all your work on earth is done. Father, we're just so thankful that you've left the Holy Spirit to be amongst us, to work in us, to work through us, to bring life, to bring light, to bring understanding, Father, to cause your word to become living and powerful within our own hearts. And God, with those times that do come and, Lord, confront us, Lord, hit us right between the eyes, unexpected things, difficult things, things, Lord, that knock the breath out of us, we thank you again that we can say, Our oh, Father, thank you for sending your Son, leaving your Spirit, so that all your work on earth can be done. And Holy Spirit, we just simply make way for you to do what only you can do. And in the process of what you do, glorify Jesus, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.